Hello, welcome to the show that gives you an insight of the most important developments of the day. This is The Big Picture and I'm Athar Khan. Yet another international ratings agency, Fitch, uh, has downgraded India's growth outlook to negative. Fitch in a statement said that it believed that the heightened risks that India's medium to long-term growth potential will gradually deteriorate if further structural reforms are not hastened. The rating agency went on to explain that the negative outlook also reflects India's restricted progress on fiscal consolidation, particularly on reducing the central government's deficit, despite improvement in the financial health of state governments. This comes in the backdrop of another ratings agency, Standard & Poor's, warning that India could lose its investment-grade status and could become the first of the so-called fallen BRICS angels. The agency expects GDP to rise uh, by 6.5% uh, 6 in FY13, down from previous projection of 7.5%, while WPI inflation is expected to rise by an average of 7.5% in FY2012-13, which, and I'm quoting from the report now, though lower than the 8.8% rise in FY2011-12, continues to be higher and stickier than previously expected, diminishing scope for monetary policy flexibility, unquote. The government, though, is not taking it lying down. Finance Minister Pranam Mukherjee has said that Fitch has ignored the recent structural reforms initiatives uh, taken by the central government, such as the UADAI, fertilizer subsidy reform, capping subsidies as a fraction of GDP, 2%, I, I am guessing, the new manufacturing and telecom policies as well. The Prime Minister, too, in his speech at the G20 summit in Mexico, has reiterated a commitment to bring down the deficit and has said that the government is determined to create an environment that could boost, uh, would boost investment sentiment and promote an atmosphere conducive to enterprise and creativity. Tonight on The Big Picture, we discuss the volley of bouncers that have hit the government by way of rating agency downgrades. And we ask our panelists whether the gloom and doom scenario projected by these agencies is actually a possibility and whether or not it has, it has hit India's image as a growing economic power. Joining me in the studio tonight is a power-packed panel which includes Dr. Santosh Mehrotra, DG, Director General of the Institute of Applied Manpower Research, also working closely with the Planning Commission. Professor Pushpesh Pant, a political analyst, senior political analyst. Uh, also, Rajesh Mahapatra, welcome back to the show, Deputy Executive Editor of the Hindustan Times. To my extreme left is Anjan Roy. He is also a senior economist. I'd like to start the show, uh, however, with Dr. Mehrotra, if I could. Sir, first, Standard & Poor's, then Moody's, now Fitch. The rating agencies have it in, in for India, or more specifically for the UPA government. Is Fitch just shooting at noise, or have they hit the bullseye? And I'll give you a third option, somewhere in the middle. I'm, I'm going to duck your question. For the simple reason... <laughs> you duck my bouncer. <laughs> no, no, for the simple reason that the methodology of all rating agencies is highly suspect. And although it might seem like a cliche, the fact remains that the savings rate of the economy remains at 32% of GDP, which is unprecedented by and large in the history of India. And the only problem is that investment is not rising. I'm sure we will come back to that. Yes. I believe that if the government puts in place a series of reforms in the next six months, and its window of opportunity is only six months, then it's possible for the economy to turn around. We haven't re hit rock bottom at all. Well played, sir. Let me tell you that. Good cover drive. We'll come back to structural reforms in just a bit. Let me come to you, uh, <clears throat> Pushpesh Pan. Now, structural reforms. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll get back to that. First, reactions to Fitch's downgrade and also S&P's downgrade. Uh, these are series of ratings agencies' downgrades. Do you think they no, I think while I would agree with Dr. Mehrotra that the methodology of the the rating agencies is highly suspect. <clears throat> but I don't think that you can have it both ways. When the rating agencies, the same rating agencies with the same flawed methodology, give you a favorable report, you go to town uh, playing the trumpet. Now, when you get an adverse report, you suddenly say they're anti-Indian, they want to subvert their growth and so on and so forth. Dr. Mehrotra made another interesting point, if the window of opportunity is the next six months. But if we remember the promises made in past, for next six months and the subsequent six months and the subsequent six months, I'm afraid both the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister have no zilch credibility at the moment. Right. I, I don't want to come to you right now. I'll come to you after I come to Mr. Anjan Roy. Uh, sir, reactions on this? And do you agree with uh, Professor Pant as well as Mero uh, Dr. Merotra that uh, we have a six-month window of opportunity? Not really. No. Why six months? You have a three-month window or two-year <coughs> window. I mean, uh, from now till another one year. Uh, see, uh, hopefully uh, presidential elections will take place. Uh, we'll have new finance minister. 
there have been instances, at least three instances, when Prime Minister has presented budget. So here is a unique opportunity for Prime Minister to make the economy turn around. He had done something previously also. So uh, one has high expectations that he would be able to do something this time as well. Now, situation is not very bad. Uh, only uh, uh, we have been growing at 8.5. We are growing at 6.5. Some little growth difference is nothing to be shouting about for a major economy. You mm. cannot expect that India for all times to come will grow at 8.5. Mm. It can be 8.5, 6.5, 7.5, 9.5. We were planning for 10% growth rate. These growth rates are neither here nor there. We can get back to this growth rate once again with a little bit of uh, some strategic uh, steps uh, uh, which will show that we are right. progressive. Right, right. That is what is needed. right. Rajesh Mahapatra, quick reaction on the fish downgrade, then I have the real question for you after that. Well, uh, see, uh, I don't uh, say that you can ignore uh, what these rating agencies do. There are two aspects to what these rating agencies do. There is an assessment of how an economy is doing and then there is a decision that they take as to whether they want to downgrade, upgrade or keep their rating unchanged. Now, more often than not, the decision is guided by how the perception about your economy is getting heightened and when I need to do something so that tomorrow nobody tells me that you didn't say so. So to me, it seems, it, you know, it may look, appear to be calibrated or some people have said it's a herd mentality, S&P, Moody's, <coughs> Fitch. Now, all those concerns that they have raised, this is not the first time they are raising these concerns. Those concerns have been raised <coughs> time and again in the past one year. What they have done today, they have finally bitten the bullet. Mm. They have said, okay, now we are downgrading. And in a way, it mirrors heightened, uh, you know, the, the, the perception turning negative overseas and also within the investor community. It sort of, in a way, mirrors. I don't think they are raising any new concerns. So mm. to, to that extent, I am not, uh, I won't say that, you know, you need to really get overworked right. by this rating down. Right. Let's have the next round of questioning from you, sir. Structural reforms. Fitch reiterated that if structural reforms are not undertaken in a hurry, India's medium to long-term growth potential will gradually deteriorate. But our government, the UPA2 government, has been unable to deliver those reforms, by and large, leave alone a few instances. Is this then a serious wake-up call for UPA2? Well, I mean, irrespective of what Fitch says, there is a wake-up call. I mean, things are not well, things are True. not, you know, the global environment is no longer so benign. There are a few things that you failed to do in the past. That is why you, you have ended up in the mess that you are in today. Uh, now, uh, as far as structural reforms or reforms, you know, uh, reforms uh, mean different things to different people. Mm. Uh, for rating agencies like Fitch, uh, Standard & Poor and Moody's, uh, the reforms have a very different connotation. For some other people, reforms could have a very different connotation. Let me just tell you one simple thing. There is this talk about window of opportunity for six months, three months. Sometimes I get a sense when the government doesn't do anything to intervene in the economy, the economy actually does well. Right. That's a very interesting point that you said, Rajesh. Let me come to Dr. Mehrotra for one second and ask him this. Do you see in the near term the government actually getting down to brass tacks and starting the reform train once again, a, a train that has been stalled for, for a number of reasons, various amounts of reasons? Because even as they put up a brave front, and you will tell us, uh, you'll have a better idea of this, the government must be slightly worried as well. Oh, the government is clearly worried. There is precious little doubt about that. Uh, which is the reason why in the last week or 10 days itself, the Prime Minister called a meeting of major cabinet ministers and senior bureaucrats dealing with infrastructure. Because as you know, we're about to launch, well, we've launched the 12th five-year plan, and in the 12th five-year plan, the objective is to double infrastructure investment from the $500 billion of the 11th five-year plan, which we did achieve, by the way. Despite mm. all the misgivings and so on, we did manage to achieve the $500 billion during the 11th five-year plan, and we plan to double that in the, in, in, in the 12th five-year plan. Right, right. So you can see that 
there is already a recognition of the need for wake up mm. and that is that was the purpose of that that meeting the uh, the, the next sort of monsoon session is actually going to be absolutely critical. Mm. Uh, there are uh, important reforms that need to be put in place, the FDI in aviation, the FDI in multi-brand retail, the pension in insurance and banking reform bills on which there is bipartisan support, there shouldn't be a difficulty around that. The fact of the matter is that there is no fiscal space that the government has mm. to pump prime the economy. In other words, it can't increase public expenditure at this point, which is the way it reacted to the 2008 crisis. Right. That's not possible any longer. Mm. Today, as you know, yesterday the RBI did not cut rates. There will probably be a, po a possibility of rate cuts and easing, monetary easing. In the next meeting. In the next meeting. Mm. Perfectly possible that that might well happen. Mm. Those, these are the only, the reforms and the monetary easing are the only uh, instruments left with government. Right. And it recognizes that, in th that, that, it, that if it doesn't do it in the next six months, mm. because the next six months doesn't have too many elections. Right. In, the thir in 2013, you have a series of state elections, and then you are very close to 2014. So there is no question. I mean, although I agree with the point that have been made, oh, past six months, they didn't do it. Past six yes, but this time around, this is the last ditch opportunity. Right. right. I have a question for uh, uh, Dr. Anjan Roy, then I'll come <coughs> to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Merudra mentioned the RBI uh, meeting yesterday and they, they kept rates steady, they didn't uh, change CRR or repo rate. Now, Fitch has warned that the loosening of fiscal policy would increase India's debt to GDP ratio, which in turn would result in the downgrade of the country's sovereign ratings. India's fisc is more than what we can afford right now. CAD is also above comfortable levels. Uh, the RBI for the time being has kept rates steady. Do you think avoiding a rate cut yesterday was the right decision by the RBI with industry screaming bloody murder yesterday? See, uh, rate cut was the, uh, in a way, that is the only instrument available now. As he was saying, <coughs> pump priming is uh, not uh, possible given the fiscal situation. You Last time, what happened? Last time in 2008-9, there were two packages, two, three packages of fiscal monetary stimulus. Mm. Monetary p package was what? I mean, cutting down the interest rate. Fiscal package was some little concession in duty. Now, that little concession in duty had done marvels. That is not possible now. So you have got only the um, monetary stimulus available. Now, you have reserved that stimulus uh, application of that instrument for the time being. One hopes that it will come sometime. Uh, but some little fine-tuning of the interest rate is very, very essential. So do, do you see another uh, rate cut in the next meeting of RBI, if I it put you on the should, spot right now? It should, because, see, RBI is not cutting down rates, uh, arguing that the inflation is high. Now, if you look at inflation figures, the core inflation is very low. I mean, stable. manageable, mm -hmm. stable, mm -hmm. 4.9. It's below RBI's uh, level, I mean, the tolerable level. Mm. Now, pri food price inflation is high. It is high because of the same factors for which there was price increase last year and in 2006 to 8, because we have uh, a supply demand uh, imbalance there. Yeah. Mm. Your, your consumption of con uh, uh, food articles is increasing. Right. Your supply is not increasing. That you cannot address by uh, monetary policy measures. Uh, you, uh, we have seen that for 13 times as the RBI was raising interest rate, food inflation was rising. Mm -hmm. So why are you why are you raising interest rate for control of food inflation? Right. right. On that this note, we'll take a, a small break, sir. I'll come to uh, you after the break and uh, you, Rajesh, as well. We'll talk about stagflation. We'll talk about the G20 summit. We'll also talk about how it affects India as an investment destination for investors from abroad. That's after the break. Don't go anywhere. Just keep watching The Big Picture. Welcome back. You're still watching the big picture. Uh, let me come to you, uh, Professor Pant. How do you see this uh, 
the downgrade by Fitch right now and of course the previous uh, warnings as well affecting India as an investment destination for global investors? Look, I think, you know, I would not read too much into the downgrading. But I would not also overplay the metaphor of the waking call. I think if there is a sleeping sickness, hmm. you can have infinite waking calls and you can go back to slumber again. Hmm. And if you have a government which acts like a somnambulist, hmm. I mean the sleep metaphor is also too much. I think what Rajesh was saying is very, very significant. I don't think there is a unanimity in this country about what economic reforms are, what the pace of economic reform should be, what kind of structural reform should take place. And I think the logic of economics does not necessarily coincide with the logic of politics. It is not a question of 2013 not having too many elections. Some people speculate that there might be the general elections in 2013 itself. Right. And I think the kind of fiasco which we witnessed in the presidential elections, and I think I, f I think a little uh, disgusted when the presidential nominee starts explaining, explaining the fiscal or monetary policies. And I think uh, Dr. Anjit Roy is making a very interesting point that there is only this much you can do with monetary tweaking, fiscal policy tweaking and so on. Ultimately, people are going to respond at the polls to the rising prices and what hurts them. So I think if you if you look at still lots of people talking about, I don't see the logically what mm -hmm. Dr. Mehrotra says, the important reforms legislation awaiting the parliament. But I don't see the left changing. I don't see the Mamta Energy changing. I don't see Mulayam Singh risking his neck in Uttar Pradesh, leaving his constituency, even if it's illogical, right. even if it's irrational. Right. Do you agree there is no unanimity in this country about what economic reforms are? I think more, more than that, uh, I, I agree with uh, what Professor Pant said. I think our political class, the ruling political class, lacks the maturity and reason to deal with the problems that this country is being confronted with today. Uh, now look at our discourse, uh, and it, 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 it extends beyond the political class uh, to our policy makers, to, to people who make decisions. Uh, we talk about inflation, high inflation means what? Interest rates will not come down means what? Industry will find it difficult to take up new investment. Home buyers would find it difficult to borrow money. Car buyers will not be able to buy cars. But we don't talk about that the first constituency that gets affected by high inflation are the 600, 700 people, million people in this country right. who live on less than $2 a day. Absolutely. So now the, the discourse has to take change. Mm. And when I said that today you are probably paying a price for the mistakes that you have done in the past, mm. I was referring to 2080, uh, 2008. Today you are talking about a six month or three month window mm. and which you are saying could be the last window available to you. Mm. That time you had a much longer window. Larger window. A, yeah. a window for several months or mm. probably years to come. Mm. What did you do? You spent a lot of money on stimulation. Who did benefit from that stimulus? A large part of that stimulus actually went to the profiteering class hmm. and not the consumer class directly. A small percentage. You you had an opportunity. You know your uh, government kitty was. Uh, uh, you know you know hmm. you didn't have any fiscal constraint. You had a lot of political consensus hmm. at that point in time. You had a lot of political stability. You could have used that crisis to seek a recovery process in which those who had been left out of the previous boom could have led the recovery. Hmm. Right. But we decided to choose with those who have already benefited from it. Right. And today right. we are paying the price. Rajesh, one more question to you, very briefly if you could. Stagflation is a word we've been hearing for <laughs> over a week now. Do you believe that India is in the grip of stagflation? Which for the benefit of our viewers, uh, let me uh, just essentially say it essentially is when inflation continues to creep up with a stagnation in growth. How bad, Rajesh, is it really? No, I, I don't think people who use that term uh, really understand the uh, meaning of that term. It, it really means that the economy stagnates and you have inflation going up. And I don't think six, when if your economy is growing at 6.5%, you don't call it uh, stagnation. You know, th this is, th these, are, these are words which are very loosely used today. Is, and is more so these warnings are, uh, you know, raised by people who want to come in and make a quick buck out of this country and go back. Right. Uh, we, we, see, I, you know, let me, let me say, I, I don't think we should get worried about 6% growth. Mm. We shouldn't get worried about 6% growth. Mm -hmm. What we should worry about, how this, the benefits of this growth is distributed. If you have high inflation, inflation at a retail level topping 10% at a wholesale level, running at 7%, and while I agree with Anjan that right now the core inflation rate may seem to be stabilizing, but the inflationary pressures are clearly out there, and they are there because, you know, if you look at all the reports on the world economy today, they all are talking about inflationary pressures continuing for some more time. Hmm. So, so you, you know, you, ha you have high inflation, and that distributes income in favor of the rich. Hmm. So, so what do you do? 
settle, I, I would say, you know, it makes sense to settle for a lower or a moderated growth hmm. uh, and try and curb inflation. That right. should be the priority. Uh, coming to Dr. Marutra, sir, is, okay, uh, taking out from what Rajesh said, it's, is, is slowflation a better word then, first of all? And do you think it's really that bad as perhaps Moody and Moody's and Fitch and the S&Ps of the world seem to make it uh, sound as bad? Is it that, that bad at all? Um, I think both Rajesh and Pushpesh have made some very important points which I, I want to reflect on. And you will see that your question will also get answered. Right, right. Rajesh made the point when there was a fiscal stim stimulus post-2008 finan fis uh, financial crisis, who benefited? He doesn't believe that the poor benefited from that. And he's not the only one, sir. Oh, hold on, hold on. That's now. much. Oh, well, hold on, hold on. Hold on. So, so I want to clarify, first right, of right. all. I was in the Planning Commission. I was heading the Rural Development Division. And one of the first things we did in November of 2008, soon, you know, literally two months after the, cra after, after the collapse of Lehman, was to increase public expenditure. On what? On the Indra Awas Yojana, which is rural housing. On what? On the Rural Employment Guarantee. On what? On the old age pension program. Mm. So there were sudden increases that took place and, and uh, uh, which enabled money to flow out to the poor. Point one. Rajesh makes another point. Let's not worry about growth. Let's, let's um, focus a little bit more on, 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 on other things. Let's just remind ourselves, at this point, if we don't have growth, in, increase, you know, bring growth, growth back, we can't create the resources for increasing social expenditure mm. on the poor. Because there is no fiscal space left for increasing public expenditure on, on the poor. Now, I do buy the point that Rajesh is making that slow growth is not a disaster, provided it was employment intensive growth. And one of the fundamental points that I think I hear Rajesh making, which I would make equally strongly, mm -hmm. is that growth, unfortunately, in the period 2005 to 2010, th has not led to an increase in employment outside of agriculture. Right, right. Because all that, well, it, it, not in manufacturing, not in services as much as he would have wanted to see. In fact, mm -hmm. manufacturing employment has declined. Mm -hmm. When people have left agriculture between 2005 and 2010, mm. they've done it to work in construction. Construction is booming, which is the point I was making right, earlier, right. that infrastructure so, investment so is I increasing. Could, if I could just... Uh, okay. please, please continue. No, so, uh, but let me just finish yeah. with, the, with the point briefly, that Pushpish, mm. Pushpish was making. Mm. Pushpish continues to believe in a, in, a, in, 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 in a gloom and doom scenario. The only reason why I'm, I, I, I believe there is some ground for hope mm is precisely because I actually agree with him that the, um, that the Samajwadi Party and the TMC don't want an election. Right. Because they don't want an election, it's highly likely that they will not put the, put, put the, pull the carpet from under the feet of the, right. of the, of the government. Right, right. And there is, as I, and I'm repeating what I've said earlier, there is bipartisan support for many of the, of right. the Point legislations. Taken, sir. Point taken, sir. I'll, I'll very quickly zip through my panel, if you allow me. We'll touch upon the G20, starting with you, uh, Anjan Roy. In the backdrop of the G20 summit, we have very little time. Uh, the PM has come out with a set of commitments. For example, the commitment to keep the fiscal deficit at 5.1% of the GDP this year and targeting a growth of 8 to 9%, or, or thereabouts. Uh, although I think 7% would be more realistic. Do you think it's realistically possible to achieve those targets? Very briefly, sir, I have to zip through my panel. See, P Prime Minister has uh, given a number of things. He's talking about an infrastructure-led uh, growth for India. Uh, what he has, uh, the meeting he refers to, he has reiterated that. And he has also, very significantly, he has said that there should be an international financing structure for funding, funding infrastructure projects in emerging and developing countries. This will be a parallel to the uh, bailout funds which have been created for Europe. So, so this is the kind of approach which can bring in substantial funds and it's possible to get back to high growth path. Uh, 8.9, 8 or 9% or what? I mean, and what period, he's not very sure. Mm -hmm. He's not saying that we'll grow by 8% this year. Uh, but, but 
it's possible. Yeah. Uh, Professor Pushpesh Pant, coming to you, same question, realistically possible to achieve those targets and of course, if you want to reiterate, uh, should we be so worried about Fitch and the Moody? Uh, I somehow can't get uh, something out of my head what mm. Santosh said. Please, please. I think the lot of money, as he said when he was heading the rural development sale, mm. uh, was uh, routed to the sectors where it was needed. Mm. And I, all I remember is that a road to a very hot place is paved with good intentions. <laughs> How much of this fund has been utilized properly is a moot question. Right, right. Uh, uh, Dr. Marotra, if, if I want you uh, to sum up, and I'll give the last word to Rajesh, obviously. Targets outlined by the Prime Minister, are they realistic enough? And uh, are they achievable at all in the current scenario? Well, I just want to remind you that during the f 11th five-year plan, we managed to achieve the $500 billion infrastructure investment target. So, and, and you know, there is no, re and in, including the private sector's investment, please remember that the expectation was that 30% that of total, pop, of total investment in infrastructure during the 11th plan will be by the private sector. It's actually turned out to be 38%. In, right. the, tw in the 12th plan, it is expected to be 50%. I won't be surprised right. if we get there. Right. So I, I'm reasonably optimistic, actually. Right, right. For, we, yeah. Point taken, sir. We have to wrap up the show. Last word goes to Rajesh Mahapatra. Uh, sir, political discourse in the country needs to change. The economic discourse in the country needs to change. Uh, you, given all of that, if uh, currently you have 30 seconds to say something on the program, given the fact that Moody's and the Fitches of the world are saying what they want to say, what would you say in 30 seconds right now? Especially oh. given the fact that G20 whether, is happening. Whether we are in a gloom or doom? Uh, well, I, I, I won't say that because I'm an optimistic and mm. I, I, I would not say that I have as much faith in the government, mm. but as much faith in, in the resilience of the Indian economy, mm. in the innovativeness of our entrepreneurs. Uh, I think, you know, people will come out with solutions. In, in the PM statement, he is uh, now acknowledging that, you know, we need to pep up investment. Investment demand has to pick up mm. if this economy uh, has to come out of this slump. Mm. And I think, uh, as I said in the beginning, sometimes I get a sense that, that if the government doesn't do anything, it actually does well to the economy. Right, right. We are out of time, sir. We'll have to end the program now. I must thank all my guests, uh, Dr. Anjan Roy, Rajesh Mahapatra, uh, Professor Pushpesh Pan, Dr. Santosh Merutha. Thank you so much. The Indian economy is resilient and uh, like Rajesh said, sometimes when uh, the government doesn't do well, the economy surprises us all. That's all the time we have from The Big Picture today. Till next time when we get you another edition of The Big Picture, goodbye, good night, and thanks for watching.